What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Scout and Combine here on the Five Reasons Sports Network, also part of the Three Yards Per Carry podcast feed. I'm here with my co-host, Eric, today. Eric, how are we doing? Oh, I'm doing awesome, so I'm ready to you know, do this mock draft and uh, have some fun with it. All right, let's go ahead and get started with this. So this mock draft is going to be a seven-round mo- dueling mock drafts. Uh, we're going to be using PFF's mock draft machine built in with all seven rounds and trades. Uh, we'll be viewing it up here as well so you guys are able to see. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Eric will start off first, and I'll go ahead on the second half of the show and do my picks. We'll both give our analysis and opinions on um, the picks afternoon daniel berry sports highlights all right let's go ahead and get to it so here we have pff's uh, nfl draft mock machine we're doing a slow speed so that way we can see the picks and we have our data sets populated ready to go and we're going to go ahead and enter the draft first pick is obviously chicago i mean this has got to be caleb williams Easily. i would think so Oh, look at that. Pick three is Marvin Harrison Jr. to the New England Patriots instead of a quarterback. Changing up a little bit there. It did change up a little bit over there, too. We have Byron Murphy went to Seattle. Troy Fatano went to the Bengals. And Marius Mims to the Steelers. And here it is for pick number 21, the players that we have. We have Johnny Newton, Laitulatu, Olufashanu, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Jackson Powers, Johnson, Graham Bard. And a whole number along with two trade offers. Yeah, so let's look and see what the trade offers are. See what see how far we have to go back, right? So we got the Raiders. Um, 44 is too far to go back. Not interested in that. And then we have 46 here with the Indianapolis Colts. That's going out of the first round entirely. Yeah, not interested in that either for sure. All right, well, you have a boatload of selections that you can choose. Really good players, blue chip players here as well at pick 21. Yeah, so this is a pretty easy choice for me. Um, There's two players that if they were on the board that I'd I'd pick no matter what. Um, Troy Fatana would have been one, uh, would have been one of the options. Leatu Latu would have been my number one option. I'm glad to see him here this time. He wasn't there last time when we did our mock drafts. So, my pick here is going to be Leatu Latu, and I'm I'm really happy with that. Leatu Latu over Johnny Newton, Olufashanu, Kool Aid McKinstry, Jackson Powers, Johnson, and Graham Barton. That is the pick. Selecting it, that's a pretty good choice. I mean, the Dolphins are going best player available right now. Right, uh, Leatu Latu has been comped a lot to J. You know, one of our very own Dolphins in Jalen Phillips. Yeah. Uh, as well it's he's he's kind of like the number two slash number three edge rusher on this draft uh itself and you know that gives you an option where you know if the dolphins don't want to pay jalen phillips an absurd amount of money you have a guy right there um that can fill that void if jalen phillips does indeed leave yeah i agree i I mean i kind of see it the opposite of that. Um, I see it as an opportunity to, you know, possibly move on from Bradley Chubb and give that big deal to Jalen Phillips and still have your other, your other edge rusher on the rookie contract. Um, you know, you can never have enough good edge rushers. And I think that he's one of the best in this class and can certainly help early in the season while our, our other guys are getting healthy. All right, we're here at pick 55 already. Some names fell off the board already. Wide receiver Roman Wilson, uh, tackle Jordan Morgan, edge Darius Robinson, Lad McConkey went over to Arizona. Troy Franklin went to Indianapolis Colts. Xavier Worthy to the Jaguars. Xavier Leggett to the Eagles. Ricky Pearsall to the Rams. Jatavion Sanders, the tight end from Texas, at pick 54 to the Cleveland Browns right before the Miami Dolphins. Now, you do have a couple of picks, uh, players that you can select here, Jermaine Burton, Rook Orhoro, Keon Coleman, Jonathan Brooks, Kieran Amagadeji, Marshawn Nealon, Jalen Poe, Chris Jenkins, Jaden Hicks, Edgerin Cooper, guard Christian Haynes, and you have two trade options 
as well two trade offers as well yes yeah, so we can we can skip over the trade offers completely because there's a name on the board here that i absolutely am surprised that he's here um if we had gotten here and ricky pierce always here he'd have been an option here for me uh but keon coleman is actually the receiver that i have at number four on my board Ooh, Harrison wow. and, and neighbors i'm surprised that he made it this far and if he is on the board at 55 we should be running to the podium to pick Keon Coleman. All right, now, so you run over to the podium right, to pick so Keon. Before Coleman. you before you make the draft, can you uh, just show me what safeties are available? Because once this pick is made, um, that's probably the next thing that I'm going to look to satisfy. You have Jaden Hicks, Cam Kitchens, Kalen Bullock, the Dadrian Taylor, Demerson, Sion Vaki, and Tyke Smith. At okay, your top, four to five. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, I want to see how the board falls with, with safeties. Um, Keon Coleman is going to be my pick here, but we should be looking to pause the draft at some point here coming up to hopefully trade up for you know one particular safety that I'm looking at. All right. Why Keon Coleman specifically for this Miami Dolphins team? So I think that you know the speed that the Dolphins have, you can always use more speed, but they're missing that big target, right? And they need a wide receiver three. We don't have somebody that's worthy of getting you know that third share of targets outside of johnny smith um let's go ahead and pause the draft here all right yeah so i just feel like six on denver as far as still talking on keon coleman he's a big receiver we're running a lot of stuff on the edge we've tried to bring in bigger receivers you know like a robbie chosen like a uh, Chase Claypool that can, you know, seal the edges on that. I feel like Keon Coleman is a great fit for that and is still a dynamic receiver. Um, so I think that he would really add to our passing game. So let's look at a trade here. Um, you know, what do you think it would cost for me to come up to 76 here? I would think if you were to trade with the Denver Broncos, you would probably have to give up a future pick. I'm thinking probably you would have to give up 158 and maybe a fourth round pick to get up to number 76. Yeah, and I would absolutely do that. If... The trade will not be accepted. Ooh. So what would you have to give them? Probably a two, because typically when you're trading a future pick, uh, it's one round higher. So they're probably going to want a two. Um, can we, you know, try to do a two and in in the one ninety eight as opposed to the one fifty eight, and see if they'll they'll bite on that? Yep, they will bite on it. There we go. I like that. All right, I'll go ahead put the trade offer in. Pick number 76. Hey, where'd it go? Oh. Oh, man, I made a mistake. Yeah, I thought I so put an offer not... trade. Okay, so it didn't go through. That's fine. We can. Yeah. You wanted to Falcons. pick 79 with Atlanta? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so with Atlanta, let's do 79, 198, and a round two. How does that sound? That's perfect. Perfect. All right, we're going to offer the trade. Trade is in. All right. All right. So let's uh seventy nine. So let's go to the safeties. Let's go over to the safeties. You have Cam Kitchens, Kalen Bullock, Dadrian Taylor, Demerson, Sion Vaki as your top four for safeties. So let's scroll down a little bit more. Ty Key Smith, Cole Bishop, Bo Right Braid. there it is. So I know that this may come across as a reach. Um I think that Cole Bishop is the top safety in the draft. I think that he is a really good player. I do. I'm a big fan. He is very athletic. I think that he can play deep, you know, support in the run game. Um, and I think that some other boards have him significantly higher than this. I've had problems getting him even as high as 65 on wow. some of the other mock draft simulators that I've done, you know, I would be a little concerned trying to wait until 120 to get him. So I don't mind coming up this far to get him. Uh, I feel like Miami needs another safety. 
Uh, obviously, we're good with Holland. Poyer is a nice piece to have. I'm not sure that I am comfortable with him as safety number two. And Anthony Weaver's defense uses a lot of three safety defenses. Right. So I feel like bringing Bishop in as that safety two and letting Poyer be more of a you know, rotational guy coming off the bench, I think is mm-hmm. a good fit for this defense. So I would Cole Bishop's the guy that I wanted to come up for. And I'm, you know, I feel good for the value that I'm getting right. here. So Dane Brugler has him as his number four rated safety. He's above Camp Kitchens in that sense. Um, he played in a four two five hybrid scheme. Uh, Bishop plays fast. He plays controlled. He's always rallying to the football, regardless of you know where he was at, whether he was in the box, whether whether he was ten to twenty yards deep, as well. And uh, he stated that you know he models his game after former Patriot safety. Rodney Harrison, and he grew up a New England Patriots fan. So him going over to the Dolphins <laughs> like that would be funny. All right, putting the pick in for Cole Bishop. He's in. Cole Bishop, you're a Miami Dolphin. That's a pretty interesting pick. I wouldn't have, uh, me personally, I wouldn't have traded up for a safety within the third round knowing, you know, what the value of this safety class is in this draft. It's not a really good draft class for safety. So I would I would expect some safeties to fall and some defenders to fall as well into the third and fourth round as well because this is a very, very stacked um, offensive talent group in this draft, especially at the top end of the draft. So I would expect some defenders to fall as well. Yeah, and what you kind of said there is the reason that I went up. Um, yeah. There's not a lot of safeties that I really liked in this draft, but it is a position that I felt like we, you know, need to address. And if we are going to do it in the draft, then I would feel more comfortable with going up and getting a guy that we really want versus, you know, waiting for a safety later in the draft that's not a great draft for safeties. So let me ask you this. Um, who was – who? why – Bishop over Cam Kitchens. Athleticism. I mean, Cam Kitchens ran what, like a four six five, or something like that at the combine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I feel like uh, that Bishop just has more range than Kitchens. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like when you're looking at a guy that complements Holland, Holland can do a little bit of everything, right? So if we're going to have somebody that is capable of playing that center field position that it's going to need to be somebody that's got range that can cover some ground that allows Holland to be a little more free. And I think that he brings, you know, some of the same similarities where you could switch them too and have them interchangeable where at times Bishop could come down and do a little more stuff and let Holland roam deep. All right. We are here at pick 158 for the Miami Dolphins. You have a couple of players here on the board and you have two trade offers as well. Okay, so can you show me what tackles are on the board right now? Offensive tackles? Yep. You have Missouri's Javon Foster, Oklahoma's Walter Roos, Michigan's Ladarius Henderson, North Dakota State's Jalen Sundell. You want to look at interior offensive linemen? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, had he been on the board, the guy that I have been looking at the most here is Christian Jones. Um, I Texas. don't really – Yep, I don't understand why he's rated as low as he is. I feel like he's got a really high upside in the NFL. Um, I picture him as somebody that could potentially be, um, you know, the replacement for Armstead at left tackle if Miami would be able to get him, groom Mm -hmm. him for a year, and then be able to play him. I have him more like a second or a third round pick. So I, there's got to be something I'm missing with him. He was picked in the fourth round by the Baltimore Ravens at pick one thirty. Yeah, and I think that's even great value for him there. Um, with him off the board, I do still feel like there's opportunities to improve the offensive line. Another guy that I don't really get why he is rated as low as he is, especially as well as he did in the combine, is Tanner Bordellini right. out of Wisconsin. I mean, his numbers were off the charts for the combine. Like, He might be the most athletic lineman offensive lineman in the draft and he's got good tape to back it up too. So, you know, seeing the the rank here of 212, it just doesn't add up for me. Um right. 
so another pick that may feel like it's reaching, but I'm not sure that he'll be there with our next pick. I would get Tanner Bordellini here and hopefully he can provide some competition or some, you know, versatility among the backups of the uh-huh. interior offensive line. I really do like Bordellini and, you know, I was having a conversation with some other folks and they were telling me, you know, because of Bordellini's athleticism scores and his, you know, combine, like he shot up to a lot of teams, draft boards, and you're looking at maybe a fourth or a fifth round pick on Tanner Bordellini in the draft if it happens. Now, do you want to take Bordellini here at 158 or do you want to trade back and get a little bit of picks? You have Philadelphia at 161 and, you know, you can sneak in maybe a comp pick here or two as well if you'd like. No, I'm good with taking him here. All right, Tanner Bordellini. You are a Miami Dolphin at pick 158, a Wisconsin football player. All right. Uh, I think with Bordellini, um, he played center. He played left guard. He played right guard as well. I think more so on the interior line, uh, interior interior line at Wisconsin. Uh, Dane Bruglmer has him as the fourth rated interior offensive lineman. Um, and the fourth-rated center uh, in his draft guide. 6'4", right. 303 pounds, fourth-year junior as well. He's almost going to be 22. And I think that's, you know, th- those intangibles is something Chris Greer likes in his interior offensive lineman. Uh, you're here at pick 184 in the sixth round. All right, so can we see what edges are on the board? Yep. Or defensive ends, depending on how they classify. Edges, and I can do defensive line. Nope. We're good right there. The view that you had before had the guy that I, I'm i looking at. We had – okay, there we go. Yep, right there. So another guy similar to Bordellini that I don't get why he's so low, Brennan Jackson is – an edge that I'm very high on um, why he's here in the sixth round and why every board seems to have him in a similar range just doesn't make sense to me. When I watch him on tape, I feel like he's a guy that can come in. He can contribute early, right? He may not have been a guy that I was comfortable with, you know, passing a layout to lot to, to uh-huh. say that, you know, he can be an early season starter for us. But I do think that he can be part of that early season rotation and develop into a good player in the NFL. Um, and we do still need need help on the edge. So my pick here is going to be Brennan Jackson. Brennan Jackson from Washington State, 6'4". His rank is at 199. You're picking him up at 184. I would say that's pretty decent. Pretty decent value as well. Um, He did suffer a torn ACL in 2018, but after that, he didn't have any major injury concerns. Plays with a lot of energy. He's quick off the ball. He doesn't necessarily have, you know, like really elite speed or like an elite bend as well, but he played in the 4-2-5 base, you know, that nickel formation as well. Um, he needs to be a little bit more balanced and gives a good depth piece to this, you know, edge rotation that the Dolphins have once uh, Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb are back. And, you know, if we did have Leia Tulatu as well, I mean, that's that's a solid edge depth rotation as well. You also have Shaq Barrett that can rush the passer on this Dolphins yep. team. Yeah, so as we're getting to this next pick, this uh, you know number two forty one is another guy that I think is going to still be on the board um, under wide receivers. Looking at Tulu Griffin, I think is still going to be on the board there. Yeah, so uh, Ladetric Griffin, nicknamed Tulu Griffin. Um, huh, I ha- I haven't heard of him before yeah and i hadn't before today to be honest like i was you know, just doing kind of some final work and looking at some combine numbers kind of looking how players fit into you know some of the thresholds that greer has used before when drafting and this is a name that popped up um you know greer has a tendency to to draft players from power five schools so you know it's just a name that 
you know, kind of made sense to look at. And when I did, I was really impressed. Um, I don't understand why he is this low. He is a smaller receiver, an explosive receiver. Around 5'10 um, and 180. Yep. So the role that I would see for him would be kind of a rotational piece with Hill and Waddle. He's not, he's obviously not going to be the same caliber of player as they are, but when those guys were hurt or unavailable during the season it changed the entire timing of the offense getting a guy like griffin gives us somebody else that has similar speed that can get to the same spots at the same time keep the timing of what the offense does and be able to keep uh keep those two guys fresh later in the season he also has experience as a returner and you know maybe he could beat barrios there and as dependable as barrios is he just wasn't that explosive Griffin is an explosive player that could, you know, change field position in an instant. All right. So, Eric, we have your finalized seven round mock draft here. First pick, Edge Liatu Latu from UCLA. A PFF gives that an A plus grade because of his value on the board and what PFF grades him as. So, you know, as you guys, you know, once you guys will see this up onto our Five Reasons Twitter account. As well, you guys will take a look and see what PFF graded them as. Their grades are based on PFF's college grade and what their value and analysts see it as. So Leatula to A+. Keon Coleman, pick 55, B. We traded with Atlanta to move up in the draft, and Eric went ahead and drafted safety Cole Bishop out of Utah. Next pick in round I think five. I lost you, Sam. I'm not here. Oh, can you hear me? Hello. Our very next one was uh, center Tanner Bordellini up there. Then we had edge rusher Brennan Jackson and wide receiver Lediatric Lediatric Griffin. Bordellini, and um, you know trading up for Cole Bishop there. If you look at other draft boards, some of those players are rated higher, and in the end, when you know, I'm doing a mock draft or when Greer's sitting there and doing his draft, I think you've really got to, um, you know, be confident in the rankings that you have. I think that everybody that I got here are players that I am comfortable with. I think they all have a role that they can contribute this year. I think that Latu, Coleman, and Bishop are day one big time contributors. And I think the rest of the guys are all guys that contribute in 2024, not guys that we're going to have to wait to really get results from. So overall, I'm you know pretty happy with the way that this draft turned out. Happy, 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 man. Very happy. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get into my mock draft right here. We'll go ahead and enter the draft. Let's go ahead and let's do it, folks. All right, let's see how the board will fall here for under my mock draft. We have the Patriots picking up Drake May, Malik Neighbors to the Chargers, Romo Dunes to the Giants. I'm surprised that they had a wide receiver going to Tennessee. They need offensive line help. Um, we're having tackles fly off the board already. Troy Fatanu to Las Vegas, Talais Fuaga over to the New Orleans Saints. Byron Murphy went over to the Bengals at pick 18. Cooper DeGene to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Brock Bowers went to Chicago. All right, so we have players on the board. We have Lyle Tulatu, um, Nate Wiggins, Marius Mims, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Jackson Powers Giant Johnson, and Graham Barnes. And we have four trade opportunities as well to get some value on the board. We have Tampa, Kansas City, Atlanta, and Jacksonville. Hmm. I'm thinking, you know, maybe I can trade down a little bit, get some value. I do have some players that I do like on the offensive line right there, and also my number one rated safety in Tyler Newbin. Can also get another corner as well, you know, best player available. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry to play alongside Kendall Fuller, Jalen Ramsey, and make that, you know, secondary pretty multiple. Um, I think I may try and get some value. Out of this, get pick 26 and 92 for pick 21. 98% chance to happen. Let me see if I can snag 125 as well. 
who I think I'm going to go over value over here and I'm, I'm going to offer that trade. Uh, what are your opinions on that, Eric? Yeah. I mean, that's good value. You know, if there are, you know, let's say three players that you're comfortable with, then, you know, going down five picks, um, you know, is usually a pretty safe bet. Yeah. I'll go ahead, put the trade in. There we go. It's been accepted. Let's see where the board falls here. Oh, boy. Leia Tulatu is off. Mary Smims, Brian Thomas Jr. Oh, boy. Now, this is going to get really tight right here. We have Kool Aid McKinstry, Jackson Powers Johnson, Graham Barton, Tyler Newbin, Peyton Wilson. And we still have four trade offers here. Um, we got some extra picks. We got pick 26. As we traded back five spots, we got pick 92 and 125, some extra picks in the third and fourth round as well. So we recouped it there. Now, I'm along, along the lines of thinking I do want an offensive lineman right here. And it's at the flip of the coin for me right here. Do I go Jackson Power Johnson or do I go Graham Barton? You know, JPJ, he can play center right off the bat. He can also play left guard as well. He can fill in that hole. But the Dolphins do have Isaiah Wynn that they did re-sign. Wynn can play, uh, you know, left guard. He can also play right guard. He can also play offensive tackle. We also have Graham Barton, who's pretty versatile on the interior and exterior line. He can play tackle. He can play guard. And he can also play center. If I'm going based off of Chris Greer's draft history, of offensive linemen and you know a lot of Dolphins fans don't think he has great draft history of offensive linemen my pick would be Graham Barton here just because of his positional versatility you know god forbid if you know Aaron Brewer goes down Isaiah Wing goes down or um, you know one of our tackles goes down you know Barton can go ahead and fill in that slot as well he's a rookie pretty young I believe he's around 22 23 years of age you know has a lot of experience playing different positions I think my pick would be Graham Barton. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, I agree with those guys on the board. I think that Barton is the one that fits the offense a little better than what Jackson Powers Johnson would. Um, I do think that while well, having, you know, more have a cornerback would be nice. I'm a big fan of Kool-Aid McKinnistry. He's the top corner on my board. Um you know, I just don't know how many snaps that somebody like that is going to get in year one, whereas a Graham Barton should be a day one starter and a 1,000 snap taker mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dan Brugler has him as his number one rated center. Okay. Over, ja over Jackson Powers Johnson. So that's where the board, um, you know, fits the bill as well. And you get that positional versatility. And Graham Barton. Oh, Roman Wilson goes already um, at number 41. Ricky Pierce all at 40. Ah, oh, dang. Xavier Leggett at 51. Jalen Polk. Jalen Polk has been slowly rising. All right, we are here at pick 55. Uh, we've got some good players on the board. We have Jatavion Sanders, Jonah Ellis, Rook Orohoro, Keon Coleman, Jonathan Brooks. Marshawn Nealon, Chris Jenkins, Jaden Hicks, Edron Cooper, and Christian Haynes. Do have a trade offer as well from the Chicago Bears for pick 75. Don't think I want to trade down too much. We have some good players on the board as well. Let's take a look and see what receivers are left. We have Keon Coleman, Jalen McMillan, Xavier Worthy, Devontae Walker, Javon Baker, uh, the player that really, really lifts my eyebrow here is Jatavion Sanders right here. Um, I think, you know, we know from intelligence that at Texas Pro Day, um, they did like Xavier Worthy, but Mike McDaniel was there to see tight end Jatavion Sanders as well. He's tight end one in this draft and with a lot of analysts as well. He can line up in line. He can block. He's got elite, elite athletic traits. For tight ends, which bodes well for his, you know, position and also his progression year over year. And um, the Dolphins, outside of Jonu Smith, don't really have another, you know, pass catcher in that tight end or wide receiver group um, that can make some impact along the flats and the short intermediate areas 
of the field. And I think the pick of Jatavion Sanders sets up nicely for this Dolphins offense to be multiple and also have, you know, three to four different offensive weapons at any given point outside of Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, Raheem Mostert, and Devon A. Chain in the passing game. And he can be, help. It also helps to develop his blocking skills as well when he lines up in line. So I think I'll go ahead and pick up Jatavion Sanders here at pick 55. What's your thought process, Eric? Yeah, so I like that pick. Kind of the same idea uh, as me going with Keon Coleman. We're bringing in a bigger target to, you know, somebody can work the middle of the field while Waddle and Hill are, you know, running down the sidelines or, you know, finding some open spaces up the seam. Um, you know, we do have Johnny Smith. We got Jody Fortson on there, but neither of those guys are really uh, showstoppers in terms of a pick. Um, you know, Johnny Smith is probably going to fill that role a little more now, but if you pick up a Jatavian Sanders and he proves that he is, you know, just better than Johnny Smith in that role, then, you know, Johnny's contract doesn't prevent Miami from moving on from him next year and, you know, really letting Jatavian Sanders shine as, you know, one of those higher volume receiving options in the offense. And like you said, it's been, you know, pretty well documented that Mike McDaniel, you know, really likes Jatavian Sanders. Yeah. Um, I do think, you know, I believe Durham Smite's contract ends not this upcoming year, but next year, I think around the 2026 fiscal year. So that sets up as well if the Dolphins aren't willing to, you know, extend him. Uh, tight end, the tight end contracts for this Dolphins roster as well is pretty minimal. Doesn't take up a lot of cap space as well. And, you know, they can have multiple tight ends on this roster. They don't need to carry so many wide receivers as well. They can carry three tight ends on game day with Jatavion Sanders, John U. Smith, Durham Smythe, and sprinkle in maybe Jody Fortson um, yeah. and, our, and uh, UDFA Julian Hill. All right, we have pick number 92 here. Uh, we have Cam K Kitchens available, Christian Mahogany, Brendan Rice as well. I kind of want to take a look at uh, – not tackles, I'm sorry. Uh, I kind of want to take a look at defensive line and edge rushers right here. And the two names that really stick out here for me is Ohio, Ohio State's defensive lineman Michael Hall Jr. and Duke's Dwayne Carter. Um you know, with the Dolphins' loss of Christian Wilkins, it does leave a big talent hole. But I do think, you know, with a lot of the value signings that they did, uh, bringing back um, – what's his name? I'm totally blanking here. He used to be on this uh, – Benito Jones. Bringing back Benito Jones, signing a couple of, you know, defensive tackles as well to shore up that position. You have Zach Sealer as, you know, your number one interior defensive lineman. Uh, you do need a pass rusher on this team to complement Zach Sealer. Um, you know, we don't know how long Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips will be back. And Anthony Weaver really likes to rotate four to five defensive linemen in the game. And, you, you know, you get a younger guy in Michael Hall Jr. to do that rotation as well can help out. I also really like Cam Kitchens over here. You get another playmaking safety to compliment Javon Holland. Uh, Jordan Poyer is here on a short-term contract. Um, you want another young guy at safety. Keep that secondary young. Keep that secondary fast. The other option is I can trade back to 109, maybe get some value uh, as well. But I think I'm going to go with my gut over here, and I'm going to draft a defensive lineman, and I'm going to pick up Ohio State's Michael Hall Jr. What's your thought process with that, Eric? Yeah, so like you said, Anthony Weaver, you know, is bringing that Baltimore-style defense. And, you know, one of the staples of that defense is that there's a lot of rotation, especially on the interior defensive line. I know they picked up a lot of, um, you know, different guys, but, you know, there's not really anybody out of Zach Sealer that you say, you know, has to get X amount of snaps. So I think that, you know, bringing in a young guy that, can be part of that rotation is 
always a good move. You know, I think that the vision with the defensive tackle group is to, you know, put a bunch of pretty good guys with upside in there and just let the cream rise to the crop. So when you put somebody like Hall in there, you know, you're just adding to that pot and adding to the competition of that group. And, you know, we're hoping that we get somebody that develops the same way that Baltimore did with like a Matabuike or something like that. Right. Um, we are here at our fourth round pick which we received in a trade with Tampa Bay pick number 25. We don't really have, you know, any trade options that um, we can maybe get some more value, get some more picks as well. And I'm kind of looking here around the board. I'm looking at the safeties that are available. There's Cooper Beebe available as a guard. I don't think necessarily we need an interior lineman. There's edge rushers and Justin Ebogi, uh, Muhammad Kamara and, Offensive tackle Christian Jones. Now, you did men mention Christian Jones as being one of those guys that, you know, can battle battle it out and be that depth piece on the offensive line and potentially replace Teron Armstead as well. And I, I really do like that um, idea. We have Ben Sanat available, Charles Smith-Wade, Braylon Allen, McKinley Jackson, Kalen Carson. And... I think I'm going to go, you know, add some more depth pieces on this defensive side of the ball. And I'm actually going to take a cornerback over here. And my cornerback that I'm going to take is Wake Forest's Kalen Carson. Now, Kalen Carson is from Wake Forest uh, as well. Um, he's the number 13th ranked corner on the board. And I think he should be a little bit higher. Um He's looking to be picked around the third round as well. He's 5'11", 199 pounds, uh, has good size and length for the position as well. He's not super-duper fast as well. He's got really fluid hips. He stays attached to his route as well, and he was a four-year starter at Wake Forest, so he's got a lot, a lot of experience. Um, if he can stay healthy and uh, – you know, if he can obviously, you know, stay healthy and get some cracks in this cornerback group uh, as well, it builds some depth with Cater Kohu as, you know, your starting nickel. You can sprinkle in Carson there as well. You can move around Jalen Ramsey, Javon Holland as well into the slot, into safety, and you can put Carson out and you can test him out wide as well and get him some help. So I'm going to be picking up Kalen Carson here as – a cornerback and builds up some depth, get them younger and faster into in the secondary. Yeah. So from the, the spreadsheet that I'm working from, uh, it doesn't look like he performed at the NFL combine. Uh, and this is not a guy that I'm I, sorry. I, yeah. Not his combine, his pro day. Yeah. And I, I don't have those numbers. I'm just saying, I, um, you know, Greer seems to have a very specific mold of what he looks for in defensive backs, both mm -hmm. cornerbacks and safeties when it comes to drafting them. Obviously, get guys are a little different in the undrafted free agents like a Cater Kohu, but not having those numbers in front of me when I'm looking at his height of six foot, weighing in at 199, you know, that fits very closely into you know, the defensive backs that Greer has drafted in the past, going to Wake Forest, a power five school. You know, he, he checks a lot of boxes in terms of the defensive backs that Greer has drafted, and he's done pretty well with that. So I like that pick. Yeah, he's got um, he's got a lot of athleticism, and, you know, he's actually a very smart football player. He can switch in between zone. He can switch in between man for whatever coverage duties are needed in the NFL. He offers that inside and outside versatility, and, you know, he could be a potential NFL starter. And, you know, with this draft, you're looking at, potential starters and depth pieces for the future. I mean, cornerback is not in immediate need, but we saw last year with uh, with Xavier Howard out, Jalen Ramsey out as well. You had to put Cater Kohu in his second season outside as well, which is not his natural position. Nick Needham is coming back uh, from an Achilles tear as well. You lost safety uh Brandon Jones as well. So you're looking at, you know, a new group of cornerbacks. You need, you know, to get younger. You need to get faster. You brought in Kendall Fuller as well. He's coming up in uh, in age there. I believe he's 
27 or 28. He's about to hit his 30s. Well, you need to get younger, you need to get faster, and you need to build more of your core as well. Not to mention you also have Cam Smith, who was in Vic Fangio's doghouse last year. Yeah, and another thing, in my opinion, it's kind of difficult to make a bad day three pick either at linebacker or defensive back because those are guys that even if they can't get on the field defensively, those are going to be your core special teams guys from day one. So anytime you're picking those guys on day three, you can usually find somewhere on the field where they can help your team. Yeah, exactly. And you know we're back here in the fifth round here, and we've got a couple of trade options. The Saints at 168, Cowboys 174, Steelers at 178 as well. And I kind of want to look at another position. I'm still trying to look at safety. You know, Bo Braid is, is, is available. We just drafted a secondary player. Let's go ahead and take a look at, you know, the linebackers. We have Michael Barrett, J.D. Bertrand, Steel Chambers, and then offensive line as well. You can never have too many uh offensive lineman and i'm actually looking at offensive tackle here in missouri's javon foster power five guy played at missouri uh against sec uh defenders and defensive linemen he's 6'5 313 pounds uh he was a first team all sec uh captain he played left tackle primarily all throughout his college career and that can be your replacement for a Toronto Armstead, not necessarily skill-wise, but depth-wise as well. He's not known as a great bender, and you know he can improve his footwork and technique, but that was also the same thing with Austin Jackson as well. And look what uh, Butch Berry, our now offensive line coach, has done with Austin Jackson and this offensive line. He's got the size, he's got the strength, He's got the functional movements that NFL teams are looking for a developmental prospects. Uh, he can become a backup tackle as well, but could he eventually be a starter two, three years down the line? Uh, potentially, you know, the potential is there. So I'm picking up offensive tackle Javon Foster. Yeah, another great value. Um, when you look at the offensive lineman that Greer has drafted in the past, you know, I think that Greer gets some. Um, unfair criticism for his drafting of offensive linemen um he really has not drafted a bunch of them high a lot of the the picks that people are criticizing are you know third round or lower where you don't have a you know a high level of success no matter where you are um but when you look at the offensive linemen that he has drafted you take out solomon kinley and they all kind of look the same and javon foster falls into that that same mold you know looking at a guy that's Six four three thirteen. His, um, you know, his, the the events he did at um, the combine, those all come out in a similar range as what the other offensive linemen that Greer has drafted are. And his tape is good too. I had a third round grade on Javon Foster, so to get him in the fifth round, you know, is a great value for that. He's a guy that has some upside. You know, he is raw. But when you're drafting a guy in the fifth round, that's exactly what you're going to get. Um, You know, the hope there would be that, you know, he develops for a year and then he's part of that competition with a Keon Smith or, you know, whoever else we bring in. And the Lamb as well, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, for next year to replace Armstead. Um, But, yeah, I mean, he, you know, if he comes in and he can show that he's ready for the NFL now, he could compete with Lamb to be, you know, that swing tackle in 2024 right my next pick here in the sixth round pick 184 is going to be wide receiver luke mccaffrey uh they haven't drafted a wide receiver yet it's a very good wide receiver class and you know mccaffrey was a two-year starter at rice first team all acc and all aac in 2022 he led led the conference in receiving touchdowns and receiving was a team captain uh his testing numbers are not elite, 4.46 40-yard dash, but the Dolphins don't necessarily need another speed burner. They have a lot of speed burners on this team, and they need a different type of mold at wide receiver. They need somebody with inside and outside versatility. Um, he's a smart football player. His route movements and his route running is pretty controlled, and it is precise. And he's the type of guy that's like 
a possession target, the guy outside of Waddle and Hill on third down that can get open as well. Um, you know, he can carve out, carve out a role on special teams. You know, he can potentially be a returner. He can be a gunner as well, really help that special teams and make his name right there and be that fifth or sixth wide receiver that the Dolphins can carry on the roster. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, he's obviously not going to be Christian McCaffrey, right? But no. he, he he brings a great bloodline to the, to the team. Uh, he's a guy that's willing to do a lot of different things. Some of the dirty work that I talked about with Keon Coleman is the same stuff, stuff that you can get out of Luke McCaffrey. I mean, McCaffrey's not the same receiver that Coleman is, um, but it's still a guy who is a capable receiver, right? He can, he can get you some catches, get you some yards. Um, but I think his value is going to be more like what we saw with um, when Trent Sherfield was here as the guy that would get dirty in the run game, you know, do the special teams work. I'm a fan of Luke McCaffrey. He was on my short list of options that I was hoping were there in the sixth round as well. Um, you know, I just ended up going a different way, but he's definitely somebody that I like in that range. All right, my next pick here, pick 198 in the sixth round. I'm going for our linebacker position right here. Need somebody that can play special teams. You need uh, also a run stopper. I'm going with Ohio State Steel Chambers. He's um, a little bit on the shorter side. He's six foot, 229 pounds. He 4.75 40 yard dash, and you know he's not necessarily a pass rusher. He's a guy that can stop. Um, you know, stop running backs in the run game as well. He's got functional pers- pursuit speed. He's better in the range up against the run, and he's a very, very physical run defender as well. Uh, he played a lot in that four-two-five base game that Ohio State did. Um, he's an athletic guy. He's got solid foundational traits as a linebacker. He could be a rotational linebacker as well. Um, he'll, he's just may be a liability in the passing game. And we do have linebackers who can play the pass pretty well already. So I feel comfortable taking steel chambers here as a rotational linebacker and a special teamer. Yeah. And like I said, it's hard to, to make a bad pick with a linebacker on day three of the draft. I think his uh, athleticism is, you know, a plus for special teams. He is a little undersized, but I also think that in a Anthony Weaver type defense, that might not be as big of an emphasis. When you look at the linebackers they had in Patrick Queen and Roquan Smith, they weren't huge linebackers. So right. there is a, a path for guys like that to be successful. Right. In and Weaver's, you know, Anthony defensive Weaver's line, they're all about controlling the gap so that way the linebackers can make plays uh, in the backfield or around coverage as well. So that that fits the mold a little bit in that sense. And, you know, the last pick, for the Dolphins in this seventh round is pick 241. And I have always, always picked this guy, uh, Marshall running back Rasheen Ali. He was here on a 30 visit in Miami uh, as well. And I really like the guy. He's 5'11", 206 pounds, checks the box in terms of size, checks the box, box in terms of weight as well. And he is fast. Uh he didn't work out at the combine or the pro day. He was injured, but if you watch his film, dude is fast. And he fits the blocking scheme as well. He runs, you know, he plants his foot and bursts quickly to hit the running lanes. And he's got a boxing background as well. So his footwork, his vision, and his reaction skills, top of the line for um, our running back and a boxer as well. Uh, he was a two-year starter. He was pretty productive as well. Uh, he had a breakout season in 2021. He had two healthy seasons only, but he can control his body and he can control his speed. If you give him a hole, he will burst through it similarly like Devon Achain. And if he's in that zone blocking scheme that Miami has um, and he can stay durable, I mean, watch out. Like the combination of Raheem Mostert, uh, Devon Achain, and Rashina Ali. Could be crazy. Could be crazy for Miami. So that is my pick right there. 
Yeah, another good value. Um, like you said, he has experience in this scheme. This, uh, you know, the Shanahan system has shown over and over again they don't need a first or second round pick to be successful. Obviously, Kyle went out and traded for Christian McCaffrey, but you know, there's been a track record of them being able to take these types of day three running backs and being able to turn them into, you know, plus players and it's clear that Miami wants to continue to have a rotation at the running back position. So right. adding somebody like Ali, it's not going to be the, you know, number one or two, but could certainly compete to be, you know, number three in that rotation. Right. Um, he also had what he, he ranked number one in all of college football with seven plays of 50 plus yards, six of them were rushes. And one of them was a reception in 2023. So, you got another explosive guy into the backfield that can catch the ball. All is well and all is good in a Mike McDaniel offense. So, let's see what PFF graded my draft as. They gave me an A minus, top 51% of Miami Dolphins draft. They gave me, they gave me a C in Kalen Carson and a C plus in the Steel Chambers and Rasheen Ali. I mean, you can't go bad in the seventh round with that kind of grade, can you? Right. All right, so overall, I think we both had pretty decent, pretty good mock drafts as well. You guys go ahead and let us know. Drop some comments as well under our podcast and uh, on Twitter when we do release it as well. So, you know, I feel like we have, you know, a pretty good sense of the type of players that the Dolphins, you know, are looking at and the types of fits and mold that Chris Greer usually drafts you want to take a look at you know historically what has Greer looked at in a prospect and how does it this fit the scheme yeah Greer's been the GM for what now like seven eight years you know even though he's cycled through some coaches here if you look back over the the guys that he's drafted there's definitely been some consistent um, you know, traits that he's looking for, especially in defensive backs, interior defensive linemen, your edge players, they all kind of look the same. Um, so I think the, you know, when you're looking at a list of what is it like 500 players that are in the draft, right? You can start paring that down and start ruling out some of the players. I mean, obviously there's always going to be some exceptions, right? Like Jakeem Grant was the first five foot six guy that Greer ever drafted. So you're always going to have a couple of exceptions, especially on those those day three picks. Um, but I think when you're looking at the day one and two picks, that a lot of times when you look at the, the history of what a GM has done, that you can kind of, you know, make an educated guess on the type of players that they're looking at in the upcoming drafts. Of course. Well, Eric, this was a pleasure doing a dueling seven-round mock draft as well. Can't wait to hear what our listeners and fans are going to say about our mock drafts as well. As always, guys, fins up, baby. Thanks a lot. Have a good one.